podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the Ospreys Irie. Hello and welcome to the Ospreys Irie podcast, the podcast who is still waiting on their invite to the non-executive directory board for the the WIU. Uh, joining me this week is the busiest man in South Wales, uh, the man who's taken over Wales Online and finally given us some representation. It is Yestin. How are we, Yestin? Good, thanks. The um, Rhys Henry an- analysis piece didn't quite come to the fore, but here we are. And joining us, I told you we go big for the Scarlet's week. It is the probably most famous fan of the Ospreys. Hey, I uh, Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen's here. All right, Michael Sheen, but I, I, I didn't see him in the Riverside with a beer before the Leicester yeah, game no. last year. <laughs> he doesn't turn up much, does he? He doesn't come it along. Is. There's that one video of him in a jersey, and he thinks that counts. It's the one and only uh, Robbie, aka Squidge Rugby, <laughs> from uh, the the world's most famous rugby channel. It feels like. Well, um, that's very kind. Thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, sorry for ruining your introduction. No, you're okay. My my introductions are always uh, always uh, all over the place. Shall we say? There's also now, that lad we? that says, "Oh, sorry." There's also oh, that no, lad that says, we? "That lad that says Bosh that they get on the social media now, who apparently is a big deal on TikTok." Yeah, that that's a weird one. Clearly, like the marketing department got given some money this year, and they decided to blow it all on TikTok cameos, which oh, I'm not complaining about. Yeah, no. So I um I befriended one of the Osprey's marketing team, Bethan, who is wonderful yeah. and excellent and very good at a job. Uh, and she mentioned him to me as like we think we can get him because apparently he likes the Ospreys, and I have no idea who he is. And for watching all of his videos of him going Osprey's playing sharks, bosh. I am none the wiser. So. Well, it upset Lee Jarvis, so um, that's fine <laughs> by me. That's the um, main thing. How are we? Post, uh, we live in a post-Dragons world now, where dragons are our new glorious overlords. Uh, how are we? Have you had a good week, boys? Yeah, well, I have, from the writing aspects of things. But, um, well, it, it just kind of felt like a gut feeling that it was always going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. from a, a blast from the past from the 2016-17 season when the Ospreys were top of the league and they went to Newport in a game which was hands down a kick, well it was a kick fest because I'm pretty sure they had 109 kicks from hand that game the Ospreys win 10-0 and Justin Tiprick combines with Ollie Cracknell to score a, a crack of a try and that was like my first game away as in mm-hmm. the world match and um I, I felt I felt like walking out of that match, even though the Ospreys won. I felt like this is a tough place to go. <laughs> and as I've done another couple of trips to Rodney Fred, I've realised it is a tough place to go. So I thought, oh well, I can't make it over, over the weekend. So hopefully results will change. And of course, it hasn't. <laughs> and um, but but for I think full credit to the Dragons. Yeah, I thought they they played well. Um, they kind of exposed the Ospreys' defence in a little bit. I think the, from briefly looking at all the games throughout the season, I feel like the, the defender, either Max Nagy or Jack Walsh, normally shoots in quite late mm. from full back in the defensive line. And I think they did expose a couple of grubber kicks, which gave them a bit of territory at times. Um even though I'm not the rugby expert, yeah, I really shouldn't <laughs> it might be a little bit out of my depth. Um, but yeah, that's where I kind of thought about it from the kicking game. And then obviously once you get a red card and a yellow card, mm. it's a little bit tougher then. And yeah. Robbie, how how are we? Uh, how are yeah. you? No, good, good, good. Uh despite everything. Um, despite rugby being awful and hateful. Um, for two weeks in a row now. Um yeah, no, I was actually uh I missed the I was I had like a few friends from uni doing like a reunion thing, and we went to watch one of my friends who plays in like like the women's sixth division uh, had a game of rugby that weekend. And so we went, I watched that instead of the Ospreys and avoided the score all weekend, then watched it like late Sunday night. And boy, was that effort not worth it. 
of avoiding my phone for like two straight days in order to to just witness that in full um but yeah as you say like it was very reminiscent of i think i'm you know slightly older and i remember the back in the jerry collins and the marty holler days the number of times you'd rock up with that full team at rodney parade and suddenly the allied brew all stars would tear you apart it's just that dragons game from an off space perspective feels like the equivalent of the fiji game for wales where it just feels like the sheer dread of like, oh, we're going to lose this. They will pick up their game or we're going to lose this and we shouldn't just hangs over you and makes the entire experience pretty bittersweet. Um, and it felt like, yeah, all of that coming back home once again. So yeah. I I text Jamie Phillips from the, from mm. the Dragon's Lair and of Rap Fame in the week in our group chat picture of the 2015 All Blacks team and I said I can't wait for the Dragons to turn up on Saturday <laughs> and he and he laughed me away but then somehow Rodri Jones turned into a prime Joe Moody um, a- a- against us but we'll come to I, I had to watch um, I had to watch it on my phone in the middle of Ogna Regis Rugby Club um, where, I'm, where I'm living and uh, because it's the South Coast they're all Quinns fans so they had the Quinn Saracens game on TV and the big screen in front of me, which is depressing enough. And then on my phone, I was just watching like, you know, red cards and Luke Morgan being thick. So yeah, it was it was depressing, but we we move on. We will talk about the game in more depth. Uh, let's talk some news first though. Um everyone is injured. Um Toby Booth in his press conference today uh gave some more uh, insight on, on the injury front. So Hugh Sutton looks to be out uh, semi-long term with a knee injury. Don Morris is up, out with an upper ankle injury. Tom Florence did have, a, it looks like an ACL reconstruction back in the summer. So he's he's probably long term as well. Uh, it was revealed that James Ratty is out for six to eight weeks with shoulder damage, as well as Justin Tipperick with his thumb. We'll have surgery next week, also out for six to eight weeks. Um, Will Griff is out as well. The Toby Frick is apparently in a moon boot. There are, and this one is absolutely a rumour, um, according to the Ospreys fan forum, Jack Morgan is a doubt for the weekend. Good. Good. Just, just, just in case, you know. Um, but yeah, ev- everyone is injured. Uh, what, do we, what do we make of that? There'd been a big vibe, I think, as you're hearing all of this, of, well, at least we've still got Jack Morgan, because that went all right for Wales in the World Cup. <laughs> Just yeah. having no one else but Jack Morgan. A little bit damn bigger, but, you know, we can try and wind the clock back. Um, suddenly, suddenly it gets to the point where you're looking at struggles to put together a team, because I think Will Hickey's injured as well, um, or at least he seemed like he's always injured since he arrived. Yeah, he, he's injured. Yeah. So suddenly you're looking at the back row. You've got Morgan Morris, obviously, ever-present at eight, um, Harry Deeves can slot in at seven if you're missing Jack Morgan. But and I know we're going to look at the team later on, but suddenly you're looking at, you know, maybe you can move a lock up or you bring in, I don't know, Morgan Morse is a big ask to bring him in and, you know, play a local derby having played, what, about 15 minutes of professional rugby. Um, suddenly you're wondering if you can field a team or if you're doing like an anti springbok and you can put like six scrumalves on the bench in kind of just like protest and see if you can cause Razzy to just turn up in anger so you can field him on the flank. I don't know. Like it's, it's starting to get a bit worrying. It's the thing Toby said in the, that press conference that you can cope with an injury or two, but once they're in the same position, it starts to stack up with how thin the squad is and, you know, how small the budgets are at the minute. Um, that yeah, it starts to get quite worrying once you look at the back row position in particular, where, you know, to use this phrase, it's getting quite thin. Yes, then are we are we staring down the the, the barrel of a Dewey Lake at eight? Ooh, uh, yeah, so that that could be an option. If well, yeah, we we've got two hookers spare, haven't we? So if you wanted to chuck someone like Dewey Lake in the back row, just just a purely win turn of a ball and annoy people in the breakdown, then well, feel free. Uh, <laughs> I don't think many of us are going to complain. Um, Obviously, you mentioned Morgan Morse there. Um, as someone that went to the same school as him and oh, brief, wow. briefly played rugby with him, oh. it wasn't very long, but <laughs> I, 
average three K rugby with them. That's one for my CV. Um, if someone had told them his his first URC star would be a home game against the Scarlets, he would love it. I am <laughs> absolutely love it. If if there's any, if there's anyone that probably wants wants his first start first start to be a derby, it's probably be him. Even though he he's, might be a little bit quiet, someone that knows him quite well. Um, I think if, if someone if someone went up to him and said you're starting against the Scarlets, he would. I think he would probably relish it, despite the lack of minutes he's had, and he's 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 been in quite good nick in the Welsh Prem as well. So he mm. scored he scored last week in the same game which Tom Haberfield scored a try in. So oh yes, you, you balance that up. I think starting in the back row against the Scarlet seems seems rather fair. Well, I am very worried about that back row now because mm. it's giving Reese Davis at six vibes. Um, which yeah worked great against Leicester, but then was a bit rubbish everywhere else. Mm. Um, it, it, it's a really tough one because we don't really know the length of these injuries, and six has been a bit of a problem position for us. And then Will Griffiths sort of turned up out of nowhere, and we were like, "Yes, this is brilliant." And then Will Griffiths got injured, mm. so we said we'll go sign Jack Morgan and then play him and Tipperick as a dual seven, and now. Tipperick's injured, and we might not have Morgan. Again, purely speculation. I hope he's all right. It does look a bit thin in the ground because you know the one person you can't take out that back row is Morgan Morris at eight. Yeah. But he's just, he's just, you know, you can't do it. Realistically, we know Harry Deeves is going to be in the starting lineup. Mm. It's just whether it's at six or seven. And then, you know, for me, I want Deeves at seven as proper out and out go and tackle everything be a menace at the breakdown and then we want a big bastard at six you know you want a will griff at six but we don't have that hmm. yeah you know you, you're not going to put an undercut jack regan in there um you've got offender can only... play six supposedly tristan davis is another option but... yeah he's played six but again undercooked I'd be, I'd be a lot. Well, again, we'll go over this, but I'd be a lot happier if he played Fender and Beard, who were pretty much the same person. Um, a lot, and then a Reese Davis, Deves, Morgan Morris back row. Mm. Other than that, I think we're fine. We've got eight million scrum halves, including the world's most handsome man in Ruin Kruger. Um, he's so. He's, 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 Thomas Appleton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, other than that, there is no oh, surprising that we haven't tried to burn down anything down this week. There's no Osprey's news. Um, there was varying stuff floating around fan forums, but they are fan forums for a reason. Um, as uh, Robbie, I, Robbie, I know you're a big frequenter of that fan forum. I pop um, up every now and again. I joined during the period where it looked like we we're gonna merge a feeling because I was having sleepless nights and wanting any yeah, reassurance. I did the same. Yeah. So I started turning up and I turned up every now and again basically just to see like have we signed a hooker or anything? Um and you know what? Normally not the case. Um yeah, what a fun place. What a fun place it is. It's very positive people are not. Um let's move into looking at uh Mordor away. Um, firstly, freak anomaly or symptom of something larger? Yes, then. What are we what are we thinking? Uh, um. Well, the only ironic thing I found out of it was the the opening five minutes when the Ospreys kind of controlled things, even though they weren't going much in attack. Then they get a scrum, get the ball out somehow. Um, I don't really know how that ball flew out, but it did. One phase later, then Ruben Morgan Williams produces a kick for Prothero and you try and, and then Prothero scores. And you're thinking, well, that's that's a good start. That will do. And then that was it, um, in, in a way. Mm-hmm. And I think some social some people on social media might have been a little bit crit- critical about the kicking game. And ironically, one of the good examples of a good kick led to a red card, mm. uh, because when when that because that's a really good box kick by Ruben Williams. Yeah, yeah. 
probably close on on the money. And then obviously Prother has kind of mistimed his, his chase and has gone in far too quickly and has walloped Will Reed in the head. Um, and then the sec- yes. second half then, they just, in fairness, the Ospreys did defend quite well from about half time to about an hour. And then the yellow card comes and then you're thinking, oof, it's, it's tough to get back from there. Yeah, I think, as you say, the Provro red card is the stupidest tackle attempt I've seen in some time. And Sam Kane got sent off in a World Cup final for pointlessly shouldering Jesse Creel in the head a few weeks ago. It's just, if you're going into a tackle like that, the best case scenario really is you're getting a yellow. Um, it's just really, really stupid. And, you know, he should have known the risks. It was ridiculous. And I think often it... Um, Normally, there's more to a game, especially with how good teams are at playing with 14 now, um, than just a card. But I think that card completely threw the Ospreys both momentum off and affected the game plan massively um, in terms of the way they played this season. That I, it was something that like when I was looking at last season, and you you felt like they were close the entire way, but something was missing the entire way through last season, and hence why you know there's a couple of big games in the Montpellier and Leicester and the Scarlets over um, Boxing Day. But that was sort of it. You know, it was a handful of games and they couldn't quite get the consistency together and whatever. And he felt like something was missing. And like instinctively, I was thinking it was a kicking game. And then you saw this season when Mark Jones came in. And I think against the Sharks and against Glasgow for most of the game, it's just that like defense that they attack and feed off and that they can really put pressure on with the defense. And I think that has changed them completely. Um, and I, the last two weeks have been rough. But like I look at the last few weeks and I see more signs of a team who could kick on and win something than perhaps the last couple of years where you were having close, maybe closer results or maybe winning a couple of these games, but they felt more flukish. Whereas you saw like last week against Glasgow, they were completely dominant for that first half, just didn't get enough points on the board. Derry Lake drops the ball pretty much over the try line and you have the Provero chance as well, which doesn't bounce in the right direction. Those who sit up or if they've got, you know, they defend one of the malls better, suddenly that's a great win. Suddenly you're even looking for bonus point later on. Suddenly it's a very different game um, and the season feels very different. And in this game, I think a lot of it is in, as I said, if you're looking to use that defense to kind of uh, feed off and create errors and create chances to pressure and, you know, put the other team on the back foot. Hence, as you said, you mentioned, um, you know, how much the Ospreys have been kicking and how much they kicked in that game. Uh, suddenly, when you're trying to play that kind of strategy and you don't have a winger to chase, it kind of stops working. You saw Jack Walsh chasing a few kicks and he just, you know, he did a perfectly okay job, but he's it's not his area and he wasn't able to put the kind of required level of pressure on for that, like basically a full hour of the game. Uh, and then you lose Luke Morgan as well and that becomes even more difficult. And then you throw in the fact that like, because this defense is so aggressive, it's using the wingers a lot to kind of almost mop up mistakes. And if someone else makes an error, like, I know a lot of people are very, especially on that fan form, as you mentioned, are very critical of Luke Morgan's defense. Um, but the thing he will always give you is effort. Like that guy, yeah. if he makes an error, works really hard to get back and make up for it and make cover tackles. And, you know, someone else makes an error as well. And so he fits into that system where like, you know, because it's so aggressive up the main line, then the winger kind of like almost waits back in case there's an error somewhere else and he can sweep in and, you know, pick it up or, you know, if they get wide can then, you know, adjust. Um Suddenly, when you've lost one of your wingers, you saw the Osprey's defense become far more passive and having to slide a bit rather than being so aggressive. When they lost both wingers, it was completely gone. And, you you know, North had to cover both wings at once whilst also being 13, and it just became a bit of a nightmare. Hence, the, you know, the Rio Dyer try where that was basically impossible to defend. Like, by the time no, yeah. Morgan's off the field as well, like, that is... I, you know, I felt it. I kind of said it to myself at the time, but, like, that was an unwinnable position once. You're missing both your wingers... Your what were they eight points down? Um, I think it's a really weird game because it kind of, if it was like an autumn international or something where it mattered, but like you would forget it in a year's time, I would have felt like this was, you know, like a you can see the building blocks coming together, but there were odd problems that were very costly. Um, the problem is that in order to make the playoffs, in order to kind of you know go somewhere you kind of need to win about 10 games, basically, you know, in past seasons mm-hmm. with the URC. Uh, the only team to win 10 games and not make it was us the season before last. Um, mm-hmm. But basically, if you win 10 games, you're, you're good as in, especially picking a few bonus points, which we have, we were in the first few weeks, at least. Um, you worry with Glasgow as a home game gone, and now the Dragons here, 
those chances to win those games are starting to slip away of two games in South Africa and a game in Leinster coming up um, of the remaining matches, which that becomes the worry is like, are we learning these a, we keep having to learn these lessons over and over again um, because we keep having to change the team and things, you know, players keep disappearing and budget cups keep coming in. And, you know, we keep having to change fly half every season and a half um, and all of this. But the other thing is there's, what, 13 games left the season. They've won two games. Are they going to win eight of those 13 with three of them being borderline and winnable games in, you know, Leinster and South Africa? I don't know. I don't know. It's a it's a weird one. Sorry, I've just kind of pontificated and gone up a lot there. No, you're absolutely right. And going back to the Dragons thing, they clearly went in with a game plan. The first five minutes, you, some can argue it was a freak. Dragons were defending stupidly narrow. Um, Ruben puts in a lovely kick. And again, having played against Ruben at oh. age grade, he 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 done them kicks for years. Brother who gets on the end of that. You're thinking, right, settle down, we score the points. Um what was what was frustrating for me, and I think it was a theme throughout the game, we just failed to adapt. Mm. And I'll use the Nikki in the scrum as an example, and I'll come on to the scrum in a minute. Mm. Nikki has gone for two years now, has been arguably the most dominant scrummager in definitely Welsh rugby, but also in Earth rugby as well. Yeah. And he was illegal against uh, Lloyd Fairbrother. He was clearly not scrummaging straight going in. What was worrying is that he failed to adapt. Mm. And that was what we did all game. We failed to adapt to uh, Dragons around breakdown, Dragon, like you said, Dragons defence and how they use their wingers. And then the red card happened. Right. Yeah, by all means, tighten up the game. Go to the air with Ruben. Have Luke Morgan chase. You can't account for a Luke Morgan brain fart. You know, and mm. and trying to assassinate Rio Dyer. Yeah. So that 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 was that was the theme for me. And then you know, you come back to that word effort. Then Toby Booth got a bit of flack in his post game interview by saying, "I can't fault the boys' effort." A, what is it? Was it what else is he supposed to say? And mm. yeah, you're right. The effort was there. The boys made. Mm. You know, they they were defending with 13 men, 14 men, and it was you know if you. Looking at the stats, right? I'll go off the rugby pass stats because that's where I get them. We had 67% scrum win percentage. Can't remember the last time I saw an Ospreys team dipped under 80. Mm. Right? I think that's a freak anomaly. I don't think we'll be reft like that again. And I don't think Nicky will make the same mistakes again. Uh, line up win of 79%. Again, Dewey Lake just had probably his worst line up performance in a while. You know, he was 80 odd percent. He had, um, what was he, 88 percent, maybe 91 percent against Glasgow, which is where you're around you want to be. We look at us at attack then. We made 187 post meter con post contact meters compared to Dragons 305, which is what you expect, I think, for having to defend for large periods of the game. Yeah, yeah. So I think that again exemplifies the effort. And then I thought the defensive stats were going to be worse than they were. So bearing in mind, we made 91% of our tackles against Glasgow. It might be 95, mm. with missing seven in total. We missed 26 in this game. Mm. But with the caveat of you're defending with 14 and you're defending with 13. So as eight, that, that, that comes about an 82% of 119 tackles, which I thought was quite good, considering yeah. the line breaks for Dragons, considering... Uh, they they had fresher legs. They, you know, Bradley Roberts was amazing. You bring on Elliot D. You know, Ollie Griffiths had his best game for Dragons in, in a good mm. while. So again, the effort is there. And if I look back over the last two seasons, right, that season we won 10 games, didn't make the playoffs. Why is that? You didn't get bonus points because we were winning 12-9 against Munster or 18-6 against Ulster. Okay, the next season... We were picking up some bonus points, but we weren't consistent enough. When we go to this season, we've been relatively consistent performance-wise. We've been picking up some bonus points. We've been winning some games, and then we, we lose some games. So you can clearly see the progress has been made. And I, mm -hmm. and I had this rant on the Rat Pod on Monday. If you think Toby Booth should be stacked, you need to give your head a walk. Right? Absolutely. We, 
We were in the Belgians. We lost the Southern Kings at home with Alan Wynne Jones and Justin Tipperick on the pitch. Hmm. Right? We had won two games all season with one of them games we definitely shouldn't have won. Toby Booth, Mike Ruddock have come in. The academy is back up to a grade A standard now producing like some Morgan Morse, Tom Florence, blah, blah, blah. You could then look at the, the strength of the partnership with the university. I would like to remind people, Scarlet's had the partnership with Swansea University first. They just mm. never have properly used it. They've got that university partnership. They've identified uh, non-Welsh qualified talent, right? Look at Ethan Roots, yeah. gone on to Exton Premiership. Ethan Roots would have happily stayed if we could have given him the money. Mm. Okay? We just couldn't offer it. We just couldn't compete with what was being offered. Toby Booth has then turned normal players into internationals, which is his creed, okay? He did it in London Irish, he's done it in Bath, he's done it wherever he's got. Okay? No one four years ago thought Sam Parry was going to be a Welsh international. Sam Parry is a mm. Welsh international. Okay? If you think Toby Booth needs to go on the chopping block because all of a sudden you've got Mark Jones in defensive coach, that is that is just wrong. It's plain wrong and it's, you, you, you're going to put us backwards. Yeah. You look at what is Toby Booth's job at the end of the day, right? It is he is head coach, which is mostly really man management and culture management and you know bits of selection and so on and overall kind of just like making the big big decisions in the moments, right? Those are the fronts on which the Ospreys have been unquestionably extremely good over the last few years. Do you look at the games where they perform best, including, you know, even Glasgow last week, where obviously they lost, but they were brilliant for at least the first half. So much of that is them fighting for each other and having this real team spirit that I don't think was ever there before. You know, you go back, it wasn't there during the kind of the Jerry Collins, Shane Williams, Tommy Bow era. It's a he's built and kind of built out a real identity to this team that I think is incredibly distinctive. Um, and I love to watch and, you know, kind of really feel a part of for, you know, being a fan and supporter. And ultimately, those are the things that come down to him. The odd things that are going wrong are little bits of the attack, perhaps not landing. And, you know, you look at Brock James leaving and in comes Richard Fussell, who I think, re- by all accounts, by, you know, the looks of things, really good skills coach, perhaps promoted to be an attack coach before he was ready. Um, mm-hmm. And we saw bits of that, you know, at points. Uh, bringing in Mark Jones has been fantastic in terms of giving them something else, you know, like a, a core um, that isn't just the scrum. You know, if they've got the scrum, they've got the line out, they've got that kind of mall set piece, but they've also got a defense that can feed an attack. You then are more capable of kind of having a perhaps slightly looser attack um, that isn't as cutting edge, isn't the kind of Leinster, incredibly crisp, um, or, you know, All Blacks Island approach. Um, pardon me. I think that just on the fronts where it is Booth's responsibility. They're the areas where the Ospreys are excelling time after time. Um, as you said, like his old MO when he was at London Irish and at Bath was developing young players and bringing people through. And to a man, you look at like the most promising players, the most exciting players for Wales in the last five years have all been players that were youngsters that were kind of like 18, 19 when he brought them in, had barely played URC rugby, barely played professional rugby, and he has built them into world-class players. You know, Dewey Lake, Jack Morgan, um, and then, you know, like Tipperick's had some of his best form of his entire career has been the last few years for the Ospreys, and he hasn't perhaps been the same for Wales, but a lot of that you think you can put down to, you know, there's Kieran Williams. Um, You can kind of go players like Keelan Giles and Ruben Morgan Williams, who really? perhaps people had a period of thinking weren't going to happen, Um, you know, of like a lot of early promise that then you worried would peter out, have then picked up and become really fantastic players at this level. It's just like continuing to happen, continuing to develop these players and then you look at the next generation the james fenders the the breeze henry's you know of the world um yeah i don't know i just have an awful lot of belief and trust in him across the board and i want him to stay for the next 15 20 years and you can maybe change some of the assistance alongside but yeah you you can say he's like the not to use their club but the you know like the rob baxter type character where he's he's he knows the club inside out, you know. Hmm. Yes, then. Uh, let, right, let's move on to Scarlet's then, because okay. I think there's no point 
dwelling on that Dragons game. I think after the emotion of that one, because it stung for me as well, um, and I'm not going to bring up the Dan Bow situation and Ben White's house, because, again, that's been done yeah. to death. Um, if you want to hear my thoughts on that, listen to the rap pod. Um, you know, Dan Bow was wrong in what he did. I think he should face some punishment. It sets precedent. Anyway, um, Scarlet's at home. Probably the most interesting Welsh derby for the last couple of years because both teams are probably not in the place where they want to be, but probably where they deserve is the best way I'll put it. Yestin, mm. where for you is the game going to be won and lost? The obvious one is up front, I think. If the Ospreys can find some form up front, which hopefully with another week of games, the the players like Nicky Smith, like Dewey Lake, like Adam Beard, like whoever's going to be in the back row now there's so many injuries. Um, if you know they've got another week with as a as a collective, as a as a, as a playing group. Um, so if they can, you know, they can get themselves firing, that that set piece battle is going to be quite big. Um, the battle at Hooker between Dewey Lake and probably Ryan Elias is going to be quite big. That's that feels like a number one shootout for the for the mm-hmm. Wales job and you probably a worry is might be the battle at nine okay Ruben Morgan Williams had a good start to this season but maybe someone to the caliber of someone that's played so well like Gareth Davis like we've seen during the World Cup that could be something interesting that'd be a good test to see where Morgan Williams is um I was going to say Sam Costello but then he's injured so um, Jack Walsh against Johan Lloyd. That's going to be another exciting battle. Two young tens going at it. A little bit like last week in a way when you had mm. Walsh from Will Reed. Um, I think centres is probably going to be quite big as well. It depends what the Scarlet select with. Because I do like Eddie James and Joe Roberts as well. Those two look really good down there. And it's a big test. If Kieran, Kieran Williams, well, Toby Ruth has said that Kieran Williams is back fit. Which is huge. I cannot stress enough how how big that is. So the selection of thirteen is even bigger. Do you go for someone like George North, who might bring maybe a bit more in attack compared to someone like Owen Watkin, who I'm a big fan of? Hmm. And uh, you know, you you have a bit more, a bit, little bit more solid defensively in a way. Nothing against George, but Watkins probably the better defender of the two. While I think maybe with ball in hand. Well, except for the build-up to the Morgan Williams try against Glasgow, where Watkin plays a relatively simple pass but takes out of two Glasgow players, maybe North's probably better in terms of the the handling and creating chances in attack. The other thing is, have we heard anything if Provo is being cited or banned? Because I don't think I've heard anything, but that's no, possible. No, nothing that could is, but obviously it's it's a red card, so it'll be an automatic, at, yeah. you know, at least a one-game ban. I so, predicted on Monday it'll probably be a three to four game uh ban with mm. um brought down by a clean disciplinary record and yeah. maybe tackle intervention so you're probably looking at two to three weeks Which um nothing nothing's come out that i could find but you, you you know you know that so you know that um brother is going to be out then mm. you know, you're looking at you definitely look at daniel sende starting or moving um, north onto the wing is the other option. Or move the north onto the wing, which I think is what will happen. I think they'll move mm. north out onto the wing with Cassende on the other one and then have mm. Keith, Keith and Owen Watkin 12 and 13, which makes the most natural sense, seeing as we don't really know the status of Yeston Hopkins. Yeah. Um, you don't, you know, you know Nagy's going to start at fullback unless he, you know, he didn't pick up an injury. Again, he played well last week in you know having to deal with a lot in that backfield. Robbie, where hmm. you know, are we still favourites, or is, can you count anyone as favourites in this game? <laughs> I mean, I think the Ospreys probably being at home, and considering the Scarlets are you know one hundred and thirty odd points down on points difference this season, and you said they're both where they should be in the table. The Scarlets should be bottom. They've shipped one hundred and thirty one points. <laughs> yeah, come on, they, they are. <laughs> come on. Um, you know, being second bottom, bullshit. Um, but yeah, um, I think a lot of it comes down to can the Ospreys stay consistent? You look at that um, 
other derby a few weeks ago between the Scarlets and the the Blues, as I will continue to call them, and will never be corrected. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the Scarlets looked rotten in that for the first half. They looked pretty ropey. Then they scored one lucky try and suddenly sprung back into life and took complete control of the game. And suddenly Cardiff just sort of fell apart and let them. Um, and That's the kind of way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They've that got very good at that apart. this season. Yeah. Yeah. Of looking all right, then just nothing quite clicking. Um, and I think there's a. It would be very Ospreys, especially Ospreys this season, to look really good and look much the better team and then let in a soft try to, you know, the likes of Gareth Davis, who has been playing phenomenally well and picked it right back up, you know, as obviously player of the match in that game when he came back for the Scarlet against uh, the Blues. Um, and that that is the worry, I think. I think... I, I expect the Ospreys to be the better team on Sunday, but I don't necessarily expect them to win it. And I think that's part of the worry. Um, it's consistency and just managing to not let in a soft try or an easy, you know, moment, just letting it up for like 20 seconds at a time. And, you know, what is otherwise like maybe like a 74 minute performance out of 80 and just like letting the foot off the gas a couple of times too often and letting the Scots back in the game because the other sort of team that that thrives on little moments they can take confidence from and have been, you know, under Dwayne Peel. Uh, yeah, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah. A little bit of that last season, I thought. Mm. Uh, the derby on, on Boxing D in Swansea. Because the Ospreys took control in that first the first half, obviously, with OK, the, the Scarlets did have a red card. But they scored. I want to say Callum Forney scored. And then at the start of the second half, the Ospreys are on counter-attack. Then McNichol intercepts it and runs in. And you think, it's game on. Mm. And if I think if that were to happen again... It could be, a, and and if of course if it's fifteen against fifteen, and hopefully there's no cards on the weekend, um, unless someone shoots someone's head off, um, but um, but yeah, you know, if if maybe if it's a little bit tighter, that could favour the Scarlet. I can kind of see in Robbie's ways, you know, the Ospreys could easily be the better side, but we all know they can easily slip up and let in a couple of really easy tries and somehow lose the game, even though they've been the better side for about seventy-seven minutes, but it could. You know, if the Ospreys can just keep that control, that that's so important. You know, even kick in for territory, or you know, just send the one up in the air if needs be. If if you're losing a little bit of momentum, hmm. just, they just need to make sure the control is there, and they don't let easy ins. And I'm sure Toby Booth is all over that this week in training. I'm, I'm I'll be I'll be stunned if he isn't. And they, you know, okay, there's going to be some new players in there because of injury, but sure they can all just smash their heads together and say, right, this is a game that you have to win. Yeah. yeah. I'd be surprised if Duncan Jones has let them not be near a scrum machine this week. <laughs> there have just been photos of Rodri Jones around like Tom Bota's locker <laughs> saying, this is what you lost to. Or, you know, and I think the, the performance you probably are looking to emulate is that 50-odd point win we had uh, season before last at home. Mm. Where Scarlet's probably took control in that first couple of that first half, then you know you just get the ball rolling. You had scrum dominance, you have lineup dominance. You know that was probably where we were at the peak of our mall powers, at the peak of our scrum powers, and then you just keep that scoreboard pressure because I think the Scarlets will just start to crumble. And you look at um, you know you look at how low on confidence MZ Matthias looked. Uh, in that Blues game where, you know, I don't necessarily think he's an awful prop. I just think he doesn't paint a good picture for referees. Um, can you put pressure on whatever bargain bin tight head they bring? Is it going to be Harry O'Connor? Is it going to be Sam Wainwright? You know, that's where you look at look at your second row. They've got no lousy, so it's going to be Alex Craig and uh, Jack Price, probably, you know. Yeah, I guess so. And then their back row, they've got no, you know, the world's greatest player, Tame Plumtree, is not available. You know, the man who scored, you know, according to Hugh Griffin, scores 8 million tries in four games. They've is, got. Is Tame Plumtree real? Do we know this for a fact? I think he's an NFT. Yeah. 
<laughs> I've seen him play a number of times and I look at him and I'm like, you are you are AI generated. You just just some bloke rocked up and was like, all right, lads, I'm Tane Plumtree and I'm like 20 foot tall, quick, and no, you know, played four games of Super Rugby, which you weren't watching because Sky doesn't have the rights anymore and doesn't broadcast it, whatever. Um, and you know, I just I made up and I was qualified. I'm gonna sign for he just throws a dart. Oh, the Scarlets, I'm Welsh apparently. I don't believe in him. I don't believe there's such a guy as Tane Plumtree. I look at him and I'm like, oh, wh- right, we're into like regens in rugby challenge. Like, okay, that's just this guy's just turned up. He's not. Re- he's an actor. He's an actor no. playing a Scarlets player. I don't believe it. Tane Plumtree was what everyone thought Tyler Madron was before they realized, oh, this guy's actually really good. Yeah, <laughs> because you yeah. just have this weird this guy with a funny accent turn up and said. I'm going to play for the Ospreys. And then all of a sudden, he's now like the world's greatest Canadian import since maple syrup. Yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, he, he, that, that's probably what the vibe was like. But so they've got no Tane Plumtree uh, because he's realized he plays for the Scarlets and injured himself. They've got no Costel, uh, Costello, mm. you know. Charlie this Dickinson. is where, yeah, Charlie, Kitt, you know, Hedy Leather Barrow, again, another made up person. No one is called Teddy Leatherbarrow. I'm no. sorry. No, 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 no. I don't believe in him. Scarlet's fans have been hyping him up as the new Jack Morgan. Um, in my mind, Jack Morgan never played any rugby before joining the Ospreys. We just found him like a like a bargain bin in Aberavon somewhere. Oh, I um, swear, all his games for the Scarlet's like a Mandela effect thing. He look, he never played for the Scarlet's. It's just no. some people falsely remember this. It's a rumor. You know, I think it'll be a really. I think we have to get a set piece parity. And, you know, I'm a prop myself. If you don't have that, at least scrum going forward, you, you're gonna you're gonna struggle. My only worry, and I know you don't like ref chat, Robbie, is a referee on debut, right? Yeah, I saw Welsh that. derby referee on debut could be a disaster. Mm. Um, very quickly. Um, we're going to do some squad predictions. Five minutes. Okay. Um, are we in agreement that Nikki starts at one? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I could well see Gareth coming in because it turns out Gareth wasn't injured. It was a personal reason he was out. So Gareth is fit. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised to see Nikki or Gareth start. Um, do we continue with Dewey? I th- again, I think so. I think you keep Dewey Lake in. Um yeah, again, I like the look of Lewis Lloyd. Um, mm. Ethan Lewis has been perfectly good, but yeah, I think you stick with Derry Lake. Sam Parry's yeah. obviously back as well, but yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Yeston, Tom Boater at three. Yes, well, well, yes, of, of course. You, you 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 cannot do much worse than Tom Boater, I think. Um, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Locks, are we saying uh, Adam Beard and Adam Beard's regen? James Fender. Is um, Reese Davis not fit? Well, I was going to say Reese Davis starts at six. Oh, of course. Because naturally there is <laughs> yeah. no one else to start at six. Yeah. Okay. No, I've forgotten the conversation we just had. Yeah. Um, no, because you're right. It's either it becomes Morse or it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. So Reese Davis starts at six. So Fender comes in second row. Yeah. Which again, I I don't mind because it's three solid lineup options. Mm. Fender can call the line as can Adam Beard. Reese Davis doesn't, but can. Um. So then uh, six, seven, eight, we go in. The world's angriest man, Reese Davis. Uh, Harry Deves and Morgan Morris. Yep, unless Jack Morgan's fit, in which case, unless Jack Morgan's fit. If Jack Morgan's fit, it'll be Deves and Morgan starting, and then Reese yeah, Davis will yeah. go into the role. But I'm only going off rumors. Uh, nine and ten, I think Rubes and and Walsh. Um, Owen's a yeah. week out, so he'll be back for the Benetton part one. Uh, and then I, I we agreed that he, uh, Kieran and um, Owen Watkin go into the centres. Yeah, I'd go with Watkin. I I really like the way Owen Watkin's playing at the minute. I like yeah, him I being as well. far more kind of solid. He's not taking so much on himself. He's just being a very willing kind of membrane for the team around him. He's leading the defense incredibly well. And I think he's working as a kind of 
kind of distribution threat, kind of like just being very, you know, engaging defenders, um, taking it in when needs be, but being far happier to kind of take a back seat almost and just run things very passively, um, which I think is really working for him. It's really kind of getting the best out of the players around him rather than him necessarily looking flash. But I'm really liking the way he's been playing this season. He also looks like he lives with Mark Jones. Like that you can yeah. tell that that defensive captain captaincy is there. So he's clearly like spending a lot of time with Mark Jones. And then a back three of uh, step aside Freddie Stewart, the new Sky King is in town, Max Nagy. Um another six foot four Englishman who plays at fullback. Yeah, the and best fullback one. to come out of the East Midlands. That <laughs> better than Freddie Stewart and me. Yeah. This one has pace. Sorry, Freddie. <laughs> um, uh, Daniel Cassende, uh, who, may I remind people, has scored tries versus the Scarlets before. Oh, hello. Uh, shout out Cheetahs in the, in the Challenge Cup. And then uh, George North on the wing. Yeah. And then whoever's got their boots on the bench. Um, Keelan, there hasn't been an update on as well. He seemed to have just disappeared. Yeah, he it's just... sort of. It looks like a niggly injury. Yeah, um, he was doing rehab. I know that. I hope he's back because he likes Scarlet's game. Mm. Um, I can't think of anyone else. We haven't had an update on Yeston Hopkins. Um, you can probably imagine Luke Scully will be involved on the bench. Reese Henry yeah. is a toss up between Henry and Warren. Um. As much as I love Henry, he probably leaning towards Warren for pure scrum dominance and being the size of a Sitch and C4. <laughs> um, probably Tristan Davis will come onto the bench. Um, I'd imagine you see Morgan Morse as next cab off the rank in the back row as well. Yeah. Um, Luke Davis or Ruin Kruger yeah. will occupy a scrum half. I think they might Wouldn't... give Kruger a go. Oh, I, I think Kruger so go. as well. Um, he's had a bit of time to acclimatise, a bit of time to learn the calls. And yeah, seems a very tidy player, you know, former South African to 20s. I haven't seen a great deal of him, but yeah, Luke Davis, I think he's been solid, but I quite like to have a look at him. Quite like to see how he how he goes. And then uh, Scully, and then most likely maybe he puts Luke Morgan onto the bench. I don't know. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if he gave him the week off and just mm. put someone else on there. Well, it's like Harry Houston's about the only player left in the squad at that point. Unless you yeah. put both Dan Edwards and Luke Scully on the bench. That, 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 was my other, that was my other thing, because Scully can play fullback. Yeah. Um, a reminder of Blaine Scully, which is mm. still gutting. Still gutting we don't. Why didn't we get a go of Blaine Scully? I don't know. But, but that's a whole well, other we conversation. Our, we had our own North American legends. Yeah. Bring back, bring back Jeff Hassler. I feel um, instinctively like this is the thing this Ospreys team is missing is a tier two player we all rally around as a local hero. Yeah, you I know, want Jeff Hassler. Our hip or Jeff Hassler. I want Jeff Hassler running at people. Like we've yeah. got Kieran Williams for a five foot ten man running at people. Oh, imagine, imagine a backline with Kieran Williams and Jeff Hassler. Oh, I can only imagine. And Yethin Hopkins, who is Q boyd as well. And then I want six foot four SA in a Tonga on the other wing. <laughs> yes, that that's all I want. Well, look, I know we've I know we've got limited time, but I listened to the podcast the other week on the way to that Sharks game in London, um, and you mentioned you wanting obscure players when you mentioned me. And I did put <laughs> I did put together a fifteen on the train right. back. So go on, go on. We'll, we'll okay, do it. Okay, we've got time. We've got, we've got someone. Time. Wait. Yeah, we've got time. Don't worry, I'll make okay. them wait. It's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I want points for whoever remembers these players. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, number one. Huge underrated player, Alex Jeffries. Yep, Scarlet's legend. Scarlet's Alex legend Jeffries. later. Uh, Matt Dwyer at hooker. Oh, uh, yes, Lee. Former. Yeah. Former, yeah, former loudmouth. Well. Was the yeah, army, army, Navy. Ca- army yeah. captain? Uh, Nicky Thomas, tired. Um, yeah. I feel like Seven you can do better. The there's, a, there's a theme with Nicky Thomas. He obviously came through in 20s with Nicky Smith, and you're like, oh, it's the Nicky combo. Never mind. Uh, Connor McKinnery in the second row. Mm. I have no, no. Uh, no clue. Irish lock played about two, maybe three games in that like golden era. So like has two Magnus League winners medals or you, you know, pro team winners medals. Played about three games in that time. Uh, De Kock Steinkamp. Yes. Who signed Absolutely. with Andy Gray, Spent two years injured, played one game off the bench and got injured in that game. 
That's like yeah. Ben Glynn levels of injury there. Right? Oh, Ben Glynn. <laughs> what a man. What a player. Um, yeah. Guy Mercer at six. Uh, yeah, the, the other Mercer. Zach Mercer's shit brother. Yeah. <laughs> the other Mercer. Who was Bath captain and they sent him out on loan. Which, yeah. I mean, sums the guy up entirely. Lee Beach at seven. Um, yes. Oh, God, that so, is a blast from the past. Yeah. Really a seven specialist, but like had a few games with the Ospreys. Now, this is my favorite, right? Number eight, Ifemi Boladal, who was an utterly terrible number eight, who basically got a professional contract because he was Fijian and okay. was atrocious. If you There's like a highlight reel of him on YouTube and it includes a clip of him running backwards where they've just like cut in really tight so you can't tell he's going in the wrong direction. He was extremely bad. I think he signed for Leicester and played like four games for them afterwards. Really, really bad player. Um, but, you know, big fan. Uh, Rodri Wells at nine. Yeah. Um, Tom number Haberfield 10. Snubbed. Sorry? Tom, Tom Haberfield has been snubbed. Oh, Tom Haberfield doesn't go in the obscure player. He goes in the greatest players of all time. He partners Dan Carter in my all-time 15th. <laughs> and also, like, I did think about this. If you, like, Tom Smith is probably a member of this team, but he played over 100 games, and that kind of means, can you still be obscure and play 100 yeah. games? I don't know. Um, number 10 is the most difficult position, I think. I won't with Luke Scully, because I think he's destined to be one the moment he retires, the moment he disappears. You you, you completely could have chose Di Flanagan. Di Flanagan, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's a good shout. Because I've had a bit of a career at Cardiff beforehand, then spent time being nowhere at the Ospreys. No, that's a better yeah. shout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Di- okay, Di Flanagan comes in at 10. Uh, wings, we have Jay Baker and the other Nicky Thomas. I actually saw yeah. Baker play on the weekend, actually. Really? He's yeah, still going? Jay Baker, yeah. yeah Raven against Pontypris, yeah, he was on the wing. How'd he get on? He was okay, Um I, well, it wasn't really a game for him because all the battles were up front. Okay. And then I think he got dragged off after about an hour. Um, yeah, I think he had a couple of touches. He still looks quite big, and you think, oh, yeah. he looks about to beat like one or two defenders. But I think Ponty kind of snuffed him out a little bit. So, um, yeah. He might end up playing against the Scarlets on the weekend. <laughs> Rate we're working for injuries. Yeah, it could be the way he's going. And yeah, the other Nicky Thomas, who was a goal kicking winger for Swansea back in the day, who got massively hyped up um, in the Welsh Prem and played like two games for the Ospreys and d- didn't really cut it. He was just a winger who was a good goal kicker. And I think it was the time of Lee Halfpenny being the best player in the world. And everyone was like, well, we've got another one. No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> Stefan Watermeyer at 12, who I always loved and thought should have seen more game time. Uh, okay. Like, really signed, had like man of the match on debut against the Dragons and then basically didn't play again. Um and was like a big like South African 12 with huge, with like really solid hands. Uh Johnny Kotzir at 13, who I don't even remember really. I went, I went with JJ Endelbrecht at 13. Oh yeah. I was there at his debut against Glasgow, which was like a 20 old draw. And Dan did he get injured in that game. I think he did. But I remember I think Kotzia might have scored in the Challenge Cup against Poe away. I think he scored like some try. I think the Ospreys were out of European contention. Mm. And I think the second half against Poe, we had a centre pairing of Tian Thomas Wheeler and Johnny Kotzia. I think both scored. So I um, do remember. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You've also got the Leslie Klim try against Rassing. Yeah, there's that. Two Leslie Klim tries against Rassin. Two, I was yes. there at that game. That was the wow. Dan Evans red card. Mm. And then, and then who's your fullback? As well. Fullback, Ross Jones. Yeah, it's Ross Jones. He's my fullback as well. Yes. We, we've got a very similar squad, except I went for Jordan Lay, oh, okay. uh, loose yep. head, who kept coming on loan from Bristol. Yeah. Uh, you could have gone Dan Suter at tight head or uh, Georgie. Or... Somehow, current World Cup player Georgie Gaijon. Yes. Um, uh, Biggest shoulders Bernard- in the world. Rainier Bernardo played thirty times, but is obscure enough mm. to go in. Um, He's a player I thought who, about. Who else did you have? There was, oh, there was a couple. There, there, but there, we have a very, very similar team. You could, you could have had like. Um, Dylan Moss at wing, who played Dylan one Moss. game against who played, who played one game against Zebra, and he's now like only known as being Keelan Giles' best mate. Oh, um, 
Uh, so we have a very, and I feel like we should do a bonus spot on just obscure Absolutely. players. Oh, I'm so because down I for feel that. like it would be brilliant. But we do have to, uh, I, I am going to welcome in two people um, who are joining us for the last part of the pod. So please welcome uh, the man in the hat, the man with the stats, and the man uh, with the threads that divide everyone's opinion. It is Hugh Griffin. And Martin, the community game maestro from the hey, Scarlet Fever podcast. <laughs> um, the Scarlet no Fever one boys. The Scarlet and... Inquisition. Yeah. <laughs> Between yeah. Hugh and Yestin, is there anyone left to other podcast in Wales? Uh, like, I think the two of you are on every podcast, Welsh rugby podcast that ever exists, ever. I think by law. Is this just like, is this a contractual thing? Who probably does a bit more podcasting than me? I, I'd argue. Oh, um, I don't know. I, I just say yes to everything. That's my thing. <laughs> he does. He's real weird that way. <laughs> Boys, how are we feeling about Sunday? Confident? Oh, 100%. You know, it's oh, going to be a walkover nice and easy. Yeah, I can't wait, mate. Walkover. You're glad to see you've doubled the amount of fans at the Scarlets we're going to bring on Sunday. Uh, yeah, and you, we're uh, going to yeah. make the Liberty twice as full as it normally is as well. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be six it, people there. Wow, yeah. There's going to be the, the referee, two touch judges, the TMO, <laughs> and uh, and uh, that children's choir you always book as well. That'd be nice. That's what I was about to say. Them out Bring for back the yeah, children's the, choir. They used to on sit. World Cup duty. They used to sit in the corner of the West Stand, right, where pretty much no one sits apart from the Scarlets on away days. And it was like something of a Doctor Who. They, um, they, they actually went for the Claremont game in Europe, the really big one. Mm. I'll confess, I was in that choir, but I didn't sing no. the game at all. And they started to sing, I can't remember what, what song, it might have been Canon Land or something like that. They started to sing right, well, it's about 10 minutes ago, and the Ospreys, I think AWJ just made a break mm. uh, in, in the 22, and I think. Wayne Barnes would have given an offside penalty and Claremont intercepted it. So obviously I didn't really, I was quite young, so I didn't really know <laughs> what was going on at the time. But everyone was singing except for me. One of my mates was now in the Osprey set, um, <laughs> Rodri Lewis. And it was just, everyone else was singing around us. Then it was just me and him watching the rugby. And I was like, well, I was here to sing, but um, you're yeah, watching the Ospreys beat Claremont in Europe, and then obviously they let it slip in extra the following week, which is really yeah. upsetting. I feel Sam like if, game. if there was ever a version of Nevermind the Buzzcocks for rugby, you would be on that for in the lineup yeah. section. It was there, were you in the children's death choir? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the uh, Georgia. Um, Australia game in the World Cup. I was sat behind the haunting children's choir they had for the opening yeah. weekend, oh. and yeah. about ten minutes in, they all fell asleep at once. Just, it was really sinister that they'd gone from being this like haunting choir butchering, you know, the Australia Australian anthem to suddenly they all just like deactivated at once. It was like something from the, the Hideo the Kojima puppeteer. game. The yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the strings. The AI <laughs> had shut down. They just like well, the thing, mm, the how it off. Choirs, everyone, everyone was talking about how horrible they were, and how, I was like, "You can't sack a children's choir." No, like, <laughs> but do you know what? It took, do you know what I didn't twig for ages was obviously it must have been lots of different children's choirs in my head. It was the same children's choir at every game, and they were getting shipped <laughs> around France. And then I was like, "Oh yeah, that can't be possible. That would be a logistical nightmare." But. <laughs> But Led by the French version of Fagan from Oliver Twist. Yeah. Which is shipping these children around France. Uh, in the boys, van. We, in the van. <laughs> we have some questions for you um, for that we posed earlier on the on the podcast. The first one, is Tane Plumtree a real person? Or is he an yeah. NFT? Ooh. No, because he's a real quite person. Frank, yeah, you think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread, you. Oh, yeah. As our, as our Twitter DMs have proven. How much do you like sliced bread? Good question. Well, I don't think I could live without it, put it that way. Okay, you couldn't uh, cut bread yourself. Well, I could. You'd but... be making sliced bread then, wouldn't you? You'd be making sliced <laughs> bread. You make a very yeah. good point. You couldn't just like reach in and just like grab it out, pull it out yourself. That's just how just that's a full-on bread roll with his soup. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, 
the spirit of sliced bread is it has to come sliced. Okay, I yeah. Think. I'm what glad we're getting question? into the, <laughs> the, the big Ma- Martin, which, which powder puff front row are you bringing on, on Sunday? Well, is it, uh, it, is it really Sam, is it Sam Wainwright? Sure was. Well, even if it is Sam Wainwright, he's still going to smash that reject. You know, Gareth Thomas, we sent on you away. You know, he's never good enough for us. Reject. Oh yeah, who is he? Who is he? Who is he sat behind at the? Who is he sat behind at Scarlet's? I can't remember Scarlet's props. Was it Phil Price? <laughs> well, no, he's a Dragons uh, prop. He is. It was. Was he? Uh, was he a Dragons prop? Oh, he was. He was Phil a Price for a while. Price Yeah, he was at Scarlet's, wasn't he? Yeah, he was at the Scarlet's, but he's a Dragons prop. Originally. Oh right, okay. Who, who, who is he sat behind? Probably someone like Reese Fawcett. He was probably behind. Oh you know? yes, the legendary Reese Fawcett, ex Osprey's yeah, hooker as well, ex Osprey's prop as well. Yeah, Simon Gardner as well. Simon, Simon Gardner, Gardner. Oh, what a player! Wrong side. He can go in the knee fifteen. But he can go in the knee fifteen. Had that one game when he was like nineteen against Leicester, where he was okay, and I was like, next big thing, next big thing. <laughs> Have you got no, Sam Lucy on the weekend? No, he's injured. But we are bringing um, Wales' first choice hooker down to, down we, to the we we go round. No? Yeah. Who, who, the, the one who actually started the big games of the World Oh my Cup. God, Sean Evans is coming to Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should be scared of that. You'll actually be taught how to jackal. Jack, Jack Morgan will be taught how to jackal. Yeah, no. Oh, another one of the rejects. Yeah. A, well, see, no, 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 I was no, saying no, this no, earlier. No, 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 no. This is like a Mandela no. effect thing. No. D- Jack Morgan never played for the Scarlets. People just collectively hallucinate and imagine he did. It never happened. There's no I know proof. That of Jack it. Morgan's good, but he's not Nelson Mandela. <laughs> he was, no, that was it. He was in prison for a while, and that was the Scarlets. Yeah. And then got out of prison uh, and became president of Australia. Parker Scarlett is Robin Island. Prison to him having so many good open sides in front of him, and now now was he got um some some old guy that should have retired years ago. You've got Teddy He's... Leatherbarrow. That's not a real person. Again, well, all these not real people say. are managing to put awesome performances out. You know, he, he's not. He's he's kind of, it was a it was an awesome performance at the weekend. I thought. Um, what was it like? Fifty-seven points shipped. Oh, it ended. It's 54. Well, put it this way. 54. 54. We I forget what it's like in those caves over Locha. <laughs> we, we scored as many points against a team that had four World Rugby Player of the Year team of the year players in it as you guys scored against a team that had the lesser known Rosser brother in it. <laughs> the fact that there's a more known Rosser brother is news to me. There's uh, Jared and Ewan. They're, they're but, not real no. people. <laughs> but no, 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 no. Okay, the thing, the thing you're missing here, though, is that um, 54 is a bigger number than 20. And look, we we were both shit at the weekend. Like, I don't know why we're picking battles on these grounds. <laughs> like, both teams were objectively shit. And Listen, now you're going, who's, oh, yeah. who's the less shit? Is the spirit of Welsh rugby? That yeah, absolutely. We are. This is the less shit derby. Have you have you gone into the archives to find like, you know, the like the three wins you have against us? That you you mean three wins in the last really? eleven derbies? You mean? Well, that's such a specific number. Why can't you just go? We've we've not lost the last three derbies. That's exactly the same vibe. Nah, you've well, got to go over you... a period of time. Teams grow over years. We I had mean, Alan Clark managing. You're already scared coming into this game. I mean, you only won one three URC games at home last year. You've, you've only won one so far this year, and you know that was a squeaky one over Zebra. I'd be scared. And yeah. we had we had Glenn Delaney. Like he doesn't exist. <laughs> hey. Glenn Delaney, N- oh, Nottingham oh. rugby he legend. Glenn Delaney. <laughs> you and Shenton Osprey's reject. How can he be a reject if he's never actually played? He was in the academy. He's, for us. Well, that's he's on the YouTube channel. He was. He's on the YouTube channel. He's basically part of the furniture, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's good. Let's be fair. Let, let's talk about the real things. Referee on debut. It's going to be the Wild West on Sunday. I was Bye. very surprised like that. So I'm a subscriber to the belief that Welsh derby shouldn't be refereed by Welsh refs, mm. and. Uh, it being a referee making his refereeing debut against the only real derby in rugby is like, I was surprised. Yeah. I hope he goes okay. You know, why do we have to have Holly last week? We could have had Holly for this one. 
She wouldn't have no, no, no. Anything. All Welsh Derby should be refed by Yako Piper because it should be refed on vibes and nothing else. Because that you that never win. No, well, no. The last time Yako Piper refed a uh, Welsh Derby, we put fifty on you. Yeah, but how many you betting on vibes? What well, vibes comes out of Swansea? Never win the have, Better vibes than come out of your lot. Have you have you ever nilled us though? Have you ever nilled us? Have you got the donut? No, because that's not in the spirit of the game. That's, no, that's what <laughs> really matters. Rugby values are better than <laughs> nils. Have to get? Do I have to get Willow in on this score? Because he will explain <laughs> this to us. We would never do that to you. Who would win in the fight in the car park? Dwayne Peel or Toby Booth? Toby Booth, come on. Oh, I'm yeah. not going to hear it wise. But see, it's Dwayne Peel was a scrum master, so he's used to starting fights and running off. Yeah. <laughs> If this is the Harvester car park outside the Liberty, <laughs> they've both had like some really overpriced lager, and it's it's Toby Booth versus Dwayne Peel. Who's winning? Oh, Peel. Uh, too quick. R- too quick. Who oh, wouldn't is... even know where he was? He'd be on his ass. <laughs> the thing is, though, like we forget that Toby Booth was like a Cockney electrician before he was a rugby coach, which doesn't sound like great credentials, admittedly, um, for you know doing a job, but. Um, I think, look, I would back that over a professional rugby player in a fight any day. Who's not even the best nine to come out of that? But that is actually hard, you know, being the best nine from the Scarlets is actually there's competition there, whereas rather, you know, all the ones that we don't like, we send your way. And and he's not exactly from Flanetley either. He's going drive by, he's tumble. Nowhere near Flanetley. Miles. That's all the same, isn't it? Well, it might be to you a lot, your brothers, your sister, and all that lot. But uh, to us, it's a bit <laughs> are you are you boys heading down for the game, Mark? Are you are you heading down? I'm still undecided. I've got a it's a toss up at the minute. Um, I, I'm coaching under eight, uh, and we've got one team going away to Ton Reval and the other team at home. So if I end up going to Ton Reval, I'm screwed. I'm never going to make it back. So I won't find out until Saturday when I'm going. And who are you making the travel down? Uh, my, uh, I think my last trip down west a couple of weeks ago to see the Cardiff game really cleaned me out. So I'm saving up to see if I can make it as far as cap for the next game. So I don't think I'm going to make this one. That, that, that'll be good. I, I, in, you know, we put the jokes aside and we will still continue I to did message, us. um What's his name? Anthony Cole Johnson to see if he let me in for free and he ignored me. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't don't blame him. I'm going to message him now and see if you'll let me in for free, despite the fact I'm already going. Um, no, I, all jokes aside, it is going to be an interesting weekend. It, both teams are, you know, Robbie is of the fact that he's gutted you're not last. It's somehow a team worse than you currently. Um, I just think points difference is all that matters, you know? <laughs> the only stat that matters. Um, yeah, and the one the one that is last is the one that even Etzebeth plays for. You know. Yeah. Speaking of car weird. parks. <laughs> oh, hello, um, Martin. Give us your player to watch from the Scarlets on the weekend. Ooh, it's gonna it's, it's, it's always got to be for Fita uh, every single time. But, but is it going to be he's having a good performance or is he having a few reds? You know. So you're choosing the Tongan Morgan Morris. <laughs> um, who who who's your player to watch? Morgan Morris, the best eight in the league. My my player to watch would be. Uh, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to come up with something a bit more original. We said we talked about leather baron. I'm going to go. Uh, my favorite player. I'm going to go Joe Roberts. He's going to show George North what a real thirteen player is like. Yeah, Joe Roberts. Yes, then who's your player to watch for the weekend? Oh, I haven't really thought about this. Um, well, Morgan Morse, go on then. You come off a bench. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll surprise someone. Morgan Morse, come off. You'll score four tries in about eight minutes. Uh, and Robbie, who's your player to watch? Uh, Scarlet's player to watch, uh, Jack Morgan. Um, <laughs> and... Hang on, no, if he never played for the Scarlet's, how can he... Be... What the... Oh, yeah, I just having that. those so inconsistent. Again. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Kieran Williams, because he's back and he is the best player of all time. Um, and I am very excited to see him 
run into a brick wall and somehow, somehow win. So your choice is Keith from Glenith, the man who used to drop me on my head at under-14s rugby. Really? Um, yes, very, very... He dropped me on my head once, and I was very angry at him. Um, but unfortunately, he's a lot harder than me, despite being 5'10". Yeah. Um, is he the same might... size he was then? He, you yes. have to clarify what you mean by harder. As in, like, he, he just used to start fights for fun. He is so... He's honestly... He's like Tasmanian Devil, but from Glenith. I love um, him so much. He's the greatest. We're, we're, we're going to have a battle of the. We're going to have a battle of the one-dimensional twelves called Williams. <laughs> yeah. I hope not. Really. I want to see a James. Yeah, I think you'll see an Eddie James. I, I, Johnny Williams is not very good. Um, I my player to watch on the weekend will be. Uh, I'm going to go James Fender. I just mm. think he's great. Mm. He's big, he's gnarly, he's in your face. Uh, another quick roundup of all the rugby happening. The Blues host the Stormers on Friday night at Cardiff Arms Park. I'm sure all four people who are going to watch that are going to enjoy. Uh, on Saturday, the Sharks host the Dragons, which will essentially be two you know, drunk chimpanzees throwing the shit at a wall. Um, no, all jokes aside, that is a big opportunity for the Dragons to go out and get get W out of South Africa. Um, just like Cardiff did, and they haven't mentioned it since. And then, of course, Sunday, the big one, three o'clock, Swansea.com Stadium, Ospreys v Scarlet. It is only on Viaplay. So, unless you're one of the eight people who subscribes to Viaplay, um, yeah, yeah, I think three of them are in this call, actually. Um, <laughs> Hey, yeah. there's some like, good Scandinavian the... films on there. I've got to watch my top 14 somewhere. Yeah. True. No, tell you what, you, you want to you be watching A Royal Affair, the 2012 film starring Mads Mikkelsen. <laughs> Solid. Mm. Alicia Vikander, outstanding in it. Let's get down to the stadium, support the boys, wear your colours, make some noise. Um, Welsh rugby needs it. Let's, let's all be frank. We need the, we need the, the big crowd. We need the noise, we need the passion. And as much as you know, one of us is going to be gutted next week, um, it'll be a great, oh, great that's... affair. Yeah, not you. You you lot are too sad already. You can't get any worse. Um I've been James. This has been the Ospreys Irie. Big thank you to Robbie for giving up his very busy schedule to spend an hour with us. Are you having me? No, please, anytime. And we will do that niche Ospreys players yes. pod. Um I, I think that genuinely will be the, the best hour of my life. <laughs> um, more Johnny Cotsier chat. Oh, I um, can't wait. I can't wait. Big up some uh, right here, Bernardo. Right here, Bernardo. Yeah. Um, give me, yeah. And then thank you to the boys from the Scarlet Fever podcast, Hugh and Martin. Um, as much as we didn't enjoy their company, we do uh, appreciate them for giving up their time. Uh, we will see you guys next week where we will hopefully be reviewing a 50-point win against the old enemy. If not, we will uh, be off air for the rest of the season because, quite <laughs> frankly, I can't fucking face it. Um, Win-win! You can catch uh, Hugh and Martin on the Scarlet Fever podcast. Uh, Hugh, you're also on the Pirate Rugby podcast, yeah? And yeah, Pirate else. Rugby pod. Yeah, and if you type in rugby, rugby podcast, either Hugh or Yester will be on there. <laughs> Uh, you can find Robbie on the Squidge Rugby YouTube channel and, well, if his videos aren't being uh, taken down, yeah. um, we, we'll get there one day. Um, you can find everything on the Osprey's IRE Twitter account. We will, we will link everyone and everything on there. Thank you all. See you next week. Scarlet. Thank you for listening to the Osprey's Ari podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to us as it really helps spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels or email us on welshregionalrugbypod at gmail.com. And remember, whatever the question, rugby is always the answer. Podcast Network.